ago the clock washed midnight away, bringing the dawn, bringing the dawn, bringing the dawn. Oh God, I must be dreaming. Time to get up again and time to start up again, pulling on my socks now. Where did the night go? Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, while you are filing into the room, um, I will say that this is welcome to panel four. This is about nightlife in the augmented city. My name is Derek Pardue. I'm an associate professor at Aarhus University and part of the night team related to the cities of Aarhus, Denmark and Lisbon, Portugal. I'm very excited to be the moderator of this panel. And um, yeah, and just before we start, we have a little bit of a pressed schedule since we have another panel, panel five, right after this about platform labor. So I want to be as um, efficient as possible. There are three presentations, four presenters, three presentations, and then about 30 minutes of Q&A. And then we will have a little break and then move on to panel five. So before we begin, quick bookkeeping. I think most people know the drill, but uh, please um, write, compose, and place your questions, comments in the chat at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And after the presentations, I will read them and we'll do it like that. Um, great, so without further ado, I think we can begin with the first presentation. This presentation is by Alva Kinney and Katie Young. Dr. Alva Kinney is based at Mary Immaculate College, University of Limerick in Ireland. Alva's research is widely published international, internationally. She is author of Communities of Musical Practice from 2016 and co-editor of Musician Teacher Collaborations, Altering the Chord from 2018. She is a Urias Fellow, Fulbright Scholar, and holds a PhD from the University of Cambridge. Katie Young is a postdoctoral research fellow on the Limerick Knight research team. She was the 2019 African Studies Association UK Fellow and recently completed a PhD on the circulation of Hindi music, Hindi film music in Ghana. With that, I give the floor to both of you. Thank you, Derek. Um, in this presentation, we want to explore narratives and cultural expressions of the night as they take new forms in digital space. We do so by exploring the recent web project, Music, Memory and the Night. And indeed, you can uh, look this up. This is uh, just a screenshot of the, of the front page. It's musicmemorynight.com. Due to the ongoing pandemic restrictions in Ireland, we as researchers had to reimagine much of what we were going to explore, the tools we would use for this exploration, as well as reconsider what our research outputs would look and sound like for the Irish project. Thus, Music, Memory and the Night is presented as an audio-visual response to our overall night research question, how are night spaces dynamically produced imagined, experienced, and narrated by migrant communities in Europe. The web project engages narratives of music at night in Galway and Cork through a collaboration between four Afro-Irish musicians and four Afro-Irish visual artists. Through interactive and multi-sensory engagement, one can explore, can explore music at night in a new way, following the closure of Irish music venues during the COVID-19 pandemic since March 2020, and indeed they've never reopened since. We're still waiting. As part of the project, musicians narrated a nocturnal memory in their city through an audio recording. Graphic designers and visual artists, each with their own experiences of, of migration, then listened and drew inspiration from these sonic memories for a commissioned artwork. Each pairing then had a conversation with each other, which was recorded. Audio memories, digital artwork and recorded musical performances were brought together on an online platform, offering one example of the ways in which memories and experiences of the urban night can be experienced in new ways in digital times. 
In our ongoing analysis of this project, we're particularly interested in how the physical, sonic and sensual elements of these musical memories are transformed within an online space. We're also concerned with questions around what is remembered and why. Thus, the discussion of these embodied and emplaced nocturnal memories address issues of migration, identity, belonging, place and gender. Through this project, we also hope to cross methodological boundaries in presenting research that is arts based, digital and interdisciplinary. To quote Bell Hooks, and, and actually this links nicely to what Sarah was, was talking about before, we clearly have the same stack of books on our bedside, Sarah. Bell Hooks writes, we are born and have our being in a, mem in a place of memory. We know ourselves through the art and act of remembering. We see this web project as encapsulating both the art and act of remembering. The web project highlights how this is both an individual but also a collective endeavour rooted to particular urban spaces, streets, sounds, venues and experiences, while at the same time invoking memories of our own, of our own drawn from different cities, different sounds. Pardu claims a creative incompleteness of memory, which invites collaborative meaning making. Resonating with this, the web project also invites the site visitors to conjure up their own memories, contribute and perhaps make meaning. Henri Lefebvre's concept of moments is also useful to consider in our examination of this project. He defines a moment as a higher form of repetition, renewal and reappearance and of the recognition of certain determinable relations with otherness or the other and with the self. Thus, the moment becomes transformed through space and time, but also in relation. Again, highlighting the previous point about the nocturnal musical memories being both individual and collective. The obvious ability of moments to repeat, renew and reappear through a digital space further pushes us to consider Lefebvre's concept in relation to the audio visual memories captured. Moments emerge from everyday experiences, or arguably every night experiences. Yet for Lefebvre, they're not part of everydayness. He contends, once profundity and beauty are lived and not simply gazed at or seen as spectacle, they become moments, combinations which marvelously overturn structures established in the everyday, replacing them by other structures, unforeseen ones and fully authentic. The moments depicted by the musicians and artists on Music, Memory and the Night also challenge and overturn structures to reveal new experiences of night spaces in Irish cities by all who experience it. In this section, we focus on two of the four musician artist pairings involved in the project. First, we will look at the collaboration between Cork-based musician DJ Safari and digital artist Grace Enamaku. Second, we will explore the interactions between Galway-based DJ collective Ubuntu DJs and digital animator Faye Orion Antar. Both pairings use a series of collaborative digital approaches to explore nocturnal musical memories without the aid of visual prompts such as photographs or videos. Through their multiple layered collaborations, each musical moment was transformed in relation to each other. These unique collaborations reveal multiple ways that music is experienced by migrants in the night. On this page, DJ Safari remembers a night at a small venue called The Sextant in Cork, where she had one of her first DJ gigs. She recalls the night through sensual means, the smell of waffles, the sensation of DJing for the first time in front of others, and the interaction between diverse attendees. On the project website, DJ Safari's recorded voice makes audible her own sensations of nighttime music making, interwoven with her DJ mix. I'll now play um, just one example of the memories um, uh, in her recording, and then you'll also get to hear a short clip of her DJ mix. 
And one thing that made the night really memorable to me was there was this little um, section, open roof section by the bar, right? And there was this chef and he would make freshly made waffles and crepes for the evening. And like, you would have your Rastafarians, your freaking hippies, your French crowd all just vibing to the music. Jay Safari, exclusive. Yeah. Walk up in the thing, I be on my game. If it's competition, I put them to the shame. Different kind of chicks, we are not the same. I raised all these babies, call me Captain Jackson. The multi sensory nature of DJ Safari's memory is reflected in Grace's digital artwork. Grace's design moves away from tangible structures and rules, reconfiguring experiential elements of space, movement, color, and perspective to align with DJ Safari's recollection of the night. Some of the night's participants slide or float through colorful depictions of sound, while others dance between DJ Safari's hand. Senses blur together as the smell of the waffle making station is brought into dialogue with DJ Safari's music making on her DJ deck. Akin to our earlier discussions of moments, Grace works to know the memory in more ways than spectacle or gaze. The memory DJ Safari selected is also interesting in relation to remembering night space. The Cork venue, The Sextant, was recently closed and demolished, and as such, digital artist Grace Enamaku engages with DJ Safari's nocturnal memory without seeing or entering into the venue herself. Without these visual prompts, Grace relates to the multisensory nature of DJ Safari's audible memory through digital means. In our second example, Galway-based DJ collective Ubuntu DJs recall their experience of a night of DJing at Halo nightclub in Galway. Though this is a DJ collective, the memory is presented as a spoken word written by collective member Kimberly. In Kimberly's spoken word recording, she explores experiences of sound and movement. For example, in the clip I'll play now, Kimberly juxtaposes her time in the smoking area where the air is still, with the music from the nightclub sounding like thuds hitting against glass doors underwater. With great courage, I stumbled my way to the smoking area. The smoking area where there is air as contradictory as it is. The air is almost still, like a fog laced with the unmistakable tinge of tobacco. The music sounds like thuds hitting against glass doors underwater. Taking comfort in the dimness of the place, I found solace in a Marlboro light, but as quickly realized I have no lighter. A hero came in the form of a faceless stranger, who really liked my music choice, but would still like to hear their favorite artist by the end of the night. And even though I knew I couldn't play it, I humored them, just for the lighter. But breaks are short-lived, and I was manifested back at the bar behind a horde of st thirsty strangers waiting patiently for a merciful bartender. Eventually, after what feels like eons, I got as many glasses as I could carry, which would be two, preparing for the small battle that is walking through the dance floor back to the decks. Kimberly's exploration of togetherness through movement and sound is reimagined in phased digital design, depicted in the multiple layers of waves of color as well as layered moving bodies. During the phone conversation between Faye and the collective, participants explored other sensory elements of that night, revealing additional layers to this moment. For example, when Faye asked the collective what colors they saw when they remembered the night, DJ Bangani described violet and crimson, Bangani explains that these colors were most often used by lighting technicians when he played slow music in the club, an aspect that transitioned the atmosphere of the night. These colors are central to Faye's design, symbolizing Bangani's experience of sound and time in the night. Through recorded spoken word, digital art, and phone conversations, Faye and the collective present ways of knowing this nocturnal musical moment that are unique to their collaboration. In conclusion, the web project Music Memory and the Night brings to life memories of the night in new ways. Berg and Sigona write that specific locations have histories and memories of migration. We have seen and heard 
how the musicians and artists, each with their own migratory histories and stories, conjure up new identities and communities through the collaboration, whether real or imagined. Further to this, we've seen and heard through physical, sonic and sensual elements, how urban musical moments are reimagined through digital means. The memories then, while tempting to view as subjective, are very much presented and received in relational ways. This collective and collaborative outcome of the project in turn facilitates new ways of knowing our cities, our nights and our music that includes all who experience it. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Alva and Katie. Um, beautiful presentation. Very nice about, you know, creating performative and methodological, you know, interconnections. Very well, very well, very well done. Um, moving on, I want to introduce Ben to you. Ben Campkin is Professor of History and Theory of Architecture and Urbanism at the Bartlett School of Architecture. He's also the co-director of UCL Urban Laboratory. His recent publications include the co-edited collections, Sexuality and Gender at Home, Experience, Politics, Transgression from Bloomsbury Press 2017 and LGBTQ plus Night Spaces, Past, Present and Future. Ben, the floor is yours. Sorry, that was going so well, but then I realized I couldn't unmute myself. Hello, thank you. Um, I will try screen sharing again. Okay. Great. Okay, thanks very much. And um, I'm starting my timer. Thanks to Manuela and Laura Solmaz and colleagues for hosting this conference and to our night colleagues and Derek uh, for chairing and to Hira for supporting our research. I'm the London PI for the project working with Low Marshall and we're researching night spaces of LGBT people in London. And our work concentrates on venues, events, and collectives organized around migrant identities and histories in London's queer scenes, such as those associated with diasporic communities and cultures. And also looks at the ways in which these venues and communities are impacted by transnational urban processes associated with global cities. So we're undertaking a set of case studies looking at themes around migration, citizenship, nationality, identity, inclusion and care. And I'm beginning with this image to flag that we're using digital methods, uh, augmenting our methods with digital means to ask where did the queer night go? And during the pandemic in lockdown, our team created the first 3D digital scan of an LGBT venue I think possibly one of the first of a night venue. I don't know of any others, but I'd be interested to hear. Um, and this is of the iconic cabaret space, the Royal Vauxhall Tavern, uh, with whom we've been collaborating, which is in many ways emblematic of some of the issues in our project, as it's the subject of an ongoing debate, a campaign to protect it as a cultural venue. And it's an excellent case for thinking about how queer belonging is formed at night, across different groups within LGBT communities, across generations, between the local and the global, the formal and the informal, across a mix of commercial and community interests. And it's the first queer venue that was architecturally listed. Um, and our scan, I think, provides a new materiality and mobility to the archive that's amassed during the campaigns to protect the space. And the, the, the scan, I'm using this particular image, uh, because it shows something of the context of the urban grain of the railway arches, Victorian railway arches, this infrastructural context. And this is really what I want to expand on and think about today. So our research is framed between queer and urban studies. And we think about the rich ways in which migration has fe featured in studies since the 1960s of the geography of sexuality and the way in which LGBT groups migrate to cities form networks and connect with technologies of urbanization. Uh, and particularly in the 2000s, there's a shift in this literature to thinking about spaces being lost or potentially lost, spaces associated with earlier liberationist politics uh, coming under threat because of neoliberal urban dynamics. 
And these studies have explored night venues all the way through since the 60s as key sites of identification and community building, protest and politics, cultural production, sex, and much more. Um, and I like to think of uh, Jose Esteban Munoz's notion of transportive spaces. These are spaces, venues, which connect the past, the present, and the future for marginalized groups. In his case, he was writing about queer and trans people of color uh, cabaret spaces in New York City. So recent activism and scholarly discussions have raised the continuing need for these venues and has asked how these groups can possibly connect and um, build community capacity without access to, to space and built space as these venues are being eliminated. But also one theme in this is to look at how scenes have been extended through the digital and through globalization. Uh, sorry, I should have been moving my image on there, but I'm working between two windows. Okay, so this was just some book covers and that quote. Jose Esteban Munoz, Networks of Queer Belongings, Draw from the Past, Critique the Present, and Offer Hopeful Transport, he uses that term, to better futures under the cover of protective darkness. Okay, so we can think about the transportive aspects of these venues quite literally in cities like London and New York, where venues have inhabited former transport infrastructure, such as these spaces, uh, a railway outbuilding, uh, which became a lesbian members club, a gay bar in a Victorian coach house, a large nightclub in a, a canal side um, uh, goods yard next to the canal, and a sauna in a viaduct space. But also infrastructure as a term has its roots in military fortifications. And so this has a particular resonance for queer groups since these venues have often had to be hidden and protective quite uh, physically. So I've been working with this concept of queer infrastructures to try and bring together some of the um, work that we've done around queer venues and to think about the network of queer venues and what they represent. Um, I'm not going to read this out in detail, but just to point to some of the themes that, the, that this is a way of thinking about the diversity of dynamic scenes embedded in infrastructure, the way in which they connect and form belonging, the way that they extend through different media, uh, the way that they transport ideas and information, and the way that they're shaped by global structures and governance structures, as well as being uh, culturally generative and disruptive and I uh, think being places of utopic imagination. So I want to turn to what's happened in London since the 2000s really and think about how these have been affected by urban governance when at this point in 2000 London had a definitive uh, change of government. It had a new uh, government structure set up, new mayoralty, and the Greater London Authority became the main uh, body for um, governing London. And so by this point, the radical social movements, the feminist, lesbian and gay, black and disability movements of the 60s and 70s had instigated a, a broader shift in Western democracies towards the inclusion of sexual diversity and citizenship within governance frameworks in the 90s and 2000s. And this was definitely a key to the GLA in its first phases. LGBT equality and citizenship were key strategic areas in London politics, but within a new orthodoxy of neoliberal global city governance. And one of the writers that when we were writing the night proposal we referred to was Doreen Massey. And I find Massey's work on London really helpful to think about how London has been an experimental ground for neoliberal urbanism. But, um, but in this context, the local and the global become very deeply entangled. Um, and she talks very brilliantly about how the global city rhetoric and rhetoric of diversity is in tension with London's legacy as a, uh, an imperial city on which its present day status is built and the uh, lasting inequalities that that reproduces within the city on particular groups. Uh, and the tensions in terms of how we think about heritage through the built environment in that context. And so often the mayor's contradictory um, statements on cosmopolitan kind of rub against uh, these uh, more conservative um, uh, structural elements. So although the first mayor of London was in his past very radical and had run the Greater London Council as an anti-racist, anti-homophobic, feminist aligned politics, 
um, uh, at this point, his politics are framed within this neoliberal context. Um, and I think it's interesting that at this moment, uh, in the first London plan, this term social infrastructure appears. And so I've been interested to see how this term is used at different points since two, the early 2000s, really. Um, uh, so this idea of social infrastructure and, and naming specific minorities, including LGBT minorities within planning, uh, comes in at this point uh, in an attempt to try and engineer better uh, equity. But at the same time, this is within the context in which um, the mayor's main power is to facilitate large scale infrastructure development. Um, there's not much resourcing behind the mayor. Um, and he oversees the transport infrastructure and the police and those kinds of bodies. But his main role is really facilitating business led uh, development of the city. And so this is uh, uh, runs counter to the interests often of grassroots venues and uh, minority groups. So you get these quite contradictory situations between discourse and practice and uh, policy and practice. And so in context of large scale infrastructure development like the Channel Tunnel Rail Link and the Crossrail project that's still being built running east-west across London, but uh, came in at this point. You see attempts to assess the equality's impacts on particular groups, but those attempts kind of failing. Um, so uh, I'm just using this example on the screen of GAY, which is a nightclub hosted in a uh, uh, another venue called the Astoria, which was demolished as part of the Crossrail development. And here I'm using this example in the particular context of this conference, because this was the first time a threat to a venue created an online petition, uh, which then alerted the mayor's office and the mayor's office raised this issue with the developers that they wanted this venue to be protected. And in fact, uh, GAY was able to take up new premises elsewhere. Um, but around the corner, lots of other smaller scale venues and those serving women, um, people of color and trans communities um, were less, uh, had less satisfactory outcomes closed um, and, and, and weren't compensated. And, um, and so this uh, created uh, a, a lot of, um, took away a lot of social infrastructure from those groups. So I'm using this as an example where this one particular venue, which is very commercially oriented and somehow in sync with these global city prerogatives does quite well, whereas these smaller scale venues do not. Um, so the work that Lo and I did before we started the night project um, mapped venues in London, licensed premises from the 1980s to 2017, 18. And it shows this graph that you can see that the numbers climb until uh, you know, sort of mid 2000s and then start to decline quite rapidly. And so even though you've got these quite supportive policies towards LGBT people in City Hall and recognition of L LGBT groups and citizenship, uh, at this point, these structural conditions start to impact quite negatively on the provision of space. And you see a link to large scale infrastructure and retail led development and also conversion of, to residential use as London's housing crisis worsened. These maps also show uh, the decline of venues. Um, and one of the stories that came out in the media and in public discussion was that actually these venues are being overtaken by online connectivity. But these suggest a very oversimplified causal logic between the proliferation of ubiquitous technologies and the demise of venues as forms of in-person sociality reduce or shift to more private domains. Such interpretations, though, I think, homogenize LGBT populations as one demographic who participate equally in the use of mobile and online technologies. And they also overshadow the continuing importance of accessing physical space and downplay the long history of extension that venues have been afforded through earlier communications technologies and media. Most importantly, perhaps, these distract from this wider post-industrial technological, cultural and economic shifts that have reshaped London's re redevelopment since the deregulation of financial markets in the 1980s. And in London, the role of large scale infrastructure development facilitated by the mayors. So the other two mayors that London has had since then were Boris Johnson and now Sadiq Khan. And each mayor has 
ostensibly engaged with LGBT groups and politics, but you can see changes in the speed and intent and material impacts of their actions as according to their politics. Uh, and this reminds us, as Sarah Ahmed argues, that the words used for diversity need to be followed around to understand how they perform or don't perform. Um, and I don't have time to look at the two, these two mayors in detail in terms of their actions, but I think it's notable that the London plan under Boris Johnson's tenure removed the mention of specific minority, LGBT minorities um, and uh, weakened the uh, uh, possibility for those groups to protect their particular social and cultural infrastructure because of that. Um, and, and that was because he rejected the idea under a banner of conservative liberalism, rejected the idea that you should be able to, um, should identify specific groups. Everybody's equal, apparently, um, so you don't need to think about the needs of specific groups. Whereas Khan has taken a more active allyship approach and has been more um, uh, advanced, advanced trans rights more and supported intersectional uh, uh, activists who are working intersectionally to support the most marginalised LGBT groups, such as the Outside Project for uh, Homeless LGBT People. So at the end of Boris Johnson's tenure, the idea of saving the night in London emerged um, and the London grassroots music venues plan was um, pitched and, and the idea of having a night um, mayor, uh, the role which Amy LeMay would then take up. Um, and these ideas, uh, uh, he also supported the listing of the Royal Boxer Tavern. So there was this transitional moment, uh, but then he, he left office and uh, Sadiq Khan kind of worked with this idea of cultural infrastructure and produced a cultural infrastructure plan. Okay, so um, even in the more supportive policy environment that we have now, venues and queer heritage are still overlooked or misunderstood or erased during development processes uh, or at odds with a commercially oriented vision or aesthetics of global London. So this long running internationally um, renowned fetish club, for example, which had operated with a late license seven days per week with no complaints for many decades in a high density area um, was the subject of development of a development and the developers didn't even mention the existence of the clubs they just said there was a disused nightclub there so they used to, there was a disused nightclub there but there was also a used nightclub there with a very strong community about it but this community weren't necessarily very social media savvy savvy and actually in the end other activists kind of took their case on and promoted it on social media and the GLA who had previously supported the development kind of withdrew their support um, and this is a site that partly the mayor has uh, remit over because it's partly owned by Transport for London. So again, connected to transport infrastructure. So this site does have, when you think about where did the queer night go, this wasn't mentioned in the heritage report for the site, which went back to the eighth century. But this um, project does have a very interesting queer history in the shadows. And so this is where the experimental filmmaker, Derek Jarman and Ron Peck, filmed here with VHS tape, uh, quite brilliantly depicting 1980s uh, nightclubs uh, and Benji's nightclub, which is as it was called at the time, showing this very diverse crowd dancing, on the, swirling around the dance floor, diverse in terms of age and ethnicity and gender and sexuality, and really this showing this idea of a club as a social condenser at night, augmented by the technologies of lighting, sound, or indeed alcohol. So to conclude then, at present, London's queer venues, including the Royal Vauxhall Tavern, are restarting after lockdown in conditions that have both uh, seen the exaggeration and worsening of the negative factors that were impacting them previously. Um, as the most archived, celebrated and internationally high profile of these venues, the Royal Vauxhall Tavern is still subject to the same local impact of licensing regulations, insecurities of changing national frameworks and pressures of development, and with the communities of artists, DJs and promoters working in ever more precarious conditions. Um, it's interesting, therefore, that they, there are collectives that have had energy during this crisis to um, innovate and move their events online. And so this is how the 25-year-old club night turned social enterprise ducky in which London's nights are Amy LeMay is a weekly presenter um, uh, moved their stuff online under this 
banner of Ducky International with this kind of old style um, flight board as their um, graphic. Um, and you know, this is uh, Ducky is referred to by one of our associate partners, Ben Walters, as a homemade mutant hope machine, a multi purpose and repeatable method of making queer space that helps to build and sustain queer infrastructure to augment difficult realities in the present. Um, so I will just end with this. At this time when there were virtually no planes over London, Ducky went international with this Zoom platformed night of performances from London, Johannesburg, Guyana, and more. Uh, with DJs uh, in various cities and dance floors in various homes. So what does it mean to host this anarchic queer performance via a corporate platform such as Zoom? I'm still thinking about this. Um, uh, it certainly captures the transposition of radical DIY cultures and aesthetics into this glitchy and dissonant digitally augmented form with a nostalgic evocation of the global which is what Munoz refers to as a kind of disidentification as much as an identification. So I'll, I'll end there, sorry, I'm over around by a couple of minutes. That's okay. Thank you for being patient, Derek. <laughs> thank you, Ben. And everyone. Uh, yeah, no, um, thank you, Ben. Uh, it's great architectural, geographic insight into this pertinent issue of creativity under what you describe as kind of the structure of a contradiction, which is a thread that has been running through this conference from the keynotes into the panels, the policy versus the practice. Um, and uh, I have many questions. I want to make sure that we have enough time for everyone, of course. So please, I would like to introduce to you uh, Rebecca Kreisel. She is a doctoral candidate in political science at the CUNY Graduate Center in the U.S. So good morning to you, Rebecca, where she studies public policy, internet-based social movements, taboos, and discourse. Rebecca, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Derek. And um, it's a real honor to, to be here among such um, uh, distinguished scholars. Um, so today I'm going to uh, share a little bit of my research on internet dance communities and uh, the right to the internet. Um, and I first want to take a step back and really emphasize the importance of the urban economy to nightlife. And I know this is probably not news to most of you since we, we're all here setting nighttime uh, in cities, um, but just narrowing in on Berlin, for example, um, in Berlin, the, the nightlife economy brings in 1.6 billion euros a year for the city. Um, and, and that's not just an economic activity, but it you know, has uh, effects on the amount of revenue that the, the actual city government can, can raise through taxes, et cetera. So it's, it's a critical component to the, economic, uh, uh, the economy of the city. And in, in addition to this, um, you know, the, the nightlife, uh, nightlife uh, um, venues ha employ about 9,000 workers at 280 official establishments. So it's a really sizable portion of employment too in Berlin, which is really, really um, an important thing to consider. Um, and, and I should note that these, no these, um, uh, these numbers were collected in 2019 by the Berlin Club Commission. Um, so this is pre-pandemic numbers, of course. Um, and in Berlin, the, the city government really um, has acknowledged the importance of club culture to the point that there is a day of club culture um, that happens on October 3rd. Um, and this was, was launched by Berlin Senator for Culture Klaus Lederer. Um, and in this past year in 2020, uh, the day saw almost 40 clubs and event collectives awarded 10,000 euros each for their commitment to hosting legal parties. So th there's, there's, a, there's a real acknowledgement in Berlin of, of needing to support and wanting to sustain the, this culture, this club culture throughout this really difficult time um, in our pandemic. Um, and, and something to mention though in Berlin, which is, you know, this is something that was happening prior to the pandemic, but you know, rising rents and real estate development have threatened the club industry, um, but it's still, as I'm sure we, we, we all know, that um, the, the, the club scene in Berlin is thriving and it's really a hub for dance music and social dancing. Um, but of course, last March, you know, when the COVID-19 pandemic start, uh, hit us, 
there was a shutdown of urban nightlife really across the world and Berlin was no exception. Um, and on March 13th, the, the Berlin nightclubs closed and this ca caused employees and artists and, and club owners to really lose their livelihoods. Um, and, and throughout the last year or 14 months, um, clubs have been able to reopen in limited capacity over the summer, um, you know, especially if there are outdoor spaces. So it's not as if it's been fully shut down for a whole year, but it's been it's been mostly shut down. So it, there, there's no it, we just saw the economic numbers of, you know, the, the sort of revenue that this industry generates. We're nowhere near where it was pre pandemic level. So, um, you know, it's a it's a major issue for for not just the city, but for, for the stakeholders involved. Um, and I wanted to share this quote and I'll read it out loud because it really encapsulates, you know, what, what, what's the, the sort of the issue really that the, the pain that we're feeling. Um, and it says, but we're having to learn to adapt and people are trying to figure out ways to keep the culture alive in the safest way possible. It's really hard morally. Of course you want to be safe and we want the pandemic to be over, but how do the clubs stay alive and how do artists keep going? So this was a quote that I found in an article in DJ Mag um, that was published this past October. What I find really important about this quote is that, that it mentions the two critical stakeholders here. It's the, the clubs. So it's, you know, the, the, the owners of these nightclubs who are small business owners, they're, they're, they, they rely on being able to let people into their establishments in order to stay afloat. Um, and then, of course, the artists who rely on these venues being open in order to perform and in order to, to sustain themselves financially um, and, and to share their art. Um, and so one solution or one, one thing that we've seen happen in the last year is really the pro proliferation of virtual dance clubs. And, and they've really emerged as a sort of alternative to in-person venues. Um, and so there, there are sort of two kinds of virtual dance clubs that, that I've seen through my research. There are some that are place-based, so they're, they're really emerging from uh, already existing venues that existed in person. Um, and one example of this um, is, is a platform that's actually run by the Berlin Club Commission. The Berlin Club Commission is a trade group that represents the interests of many nightclubs across Berlin. Um, and they started uh, a streaming service, or like a, a, a it's considered the largest dance club, uh, virtual dance club in the world currently, and it's called United We Stream. And in, in, in just two weeks um, after opening back in March, 2020, they were able to attract 5 million viewers and they raised 420,000 euros in donations, which is really significant. I mean, it just, the, the idea that people would, would log in and join a party online um, and, and donate to that extent is, is really shows the importance of these spaces. Um, and another place based, a uh, Berlin place based venue is Horror Radio, um, which uh, hosts um, sort of DJ, uh, DJ recording events. And, and they've, they've really launched uh, on YouTube and they've attracted 214,000 uh, YouTube subscribers um, since launching. Um, and then we've got what I consider Zoom native venues. So these are venues that really exist only on the internet. They're not tied to a specific location. Um, the most popular one currently is Club Quarantine. Uh, they've got 72.4 thousand followers on Instagram. Um, and at any uh, of their events, you might see, you know, anywhere between 500 to 2000 people showing up to their Zoom parties. Um, and Club Quarantine is it's considered a queer party. Uh, so building off of, uh, you know, some of what Ben was sharing, um, it's become really a space for young queers to, to connect and especially um, during this time where a lot of young queers have had to move back home, maybe into communities where they're less free to express themselves in the way that they may have been living in cities and being able to enjoy these nightlife spaces. Um, Club Quarantine has really come as a space where they can convene with other young queers around the world. Um, and, and then there's The Zone, which is a, a, a UK-based collective, another Zoom native, even though it's, it's, it's created by a UK collective, it's really Zoom native. They don't have, they're not tied to a particular location. They're less popular than Corp Club Quarantine. They've got 640 followers on Instagram, but they're still considered one of the sort of more prominent and more um, uh, well-organized um, virtual dance club. And so this leads me to, to three uh, sort of research questions that I, I find that uh, I'm sort of uh, um, thinking about right now. The first one is really this idea of like, do virtual dance parties replicate the sense of community that can be found at in-person dance parties? And if so, how? 
Um, my second question that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about is, well, what does the advent of virtual dance parties mean for the future of urban nightlife? Um, and, and finally, I'm interested in figuring out if we can think about parallels between the urban and the internet as environments where subcultures can, cre can co-create space. And if so, how? Um, so before we I dive into some of my hypotheses, I wanted to share with you a very short uh, video that was uh, produced by a New York Times um, reporter, Aurora Brockman. Um, this is a short edited two minute version of her experience of Club Quarantine. And it will give all of us an opportunity to understand what it feels like to be at a virtual dance party. <laughs> That was just a little give you gave you a little flavor of what it might feel like to be in one of these virtual dance communities. And um, while I'm thinking about this, you know, I'm, I'm trying to understand. Well, okay, why would why would someone want to attend a virtual dance uh, dance party? And uh, I really think that it comes down to the same thing as people might attract someone to engage in any kind of nighttime social dancing, and that's the 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 the, the feeling of community and wanting to be in community with others and and dance with others. Um, and so I, I posit the 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 following hypothesis that these virtual dance parties create inner dance communities that parallel the dance communities that social dancers seek at in person venues. And building off of, of Oldenburg's idea of first, second, and third places, where first place is your home in the city, your second place is where you go to work in the city, and then the third places are, you know, your bars and pubs and, and, and dance venues, places where you interact with other people in the city and you find ways to, to create yourself through social interaction. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, I see both in-person and virtual dance clubs as being third places. But what's interesting is that virtual dance parties often take place in people's homes and also known as their first place. So there's a blurring of the lines here between first place and, and third places um, in, in, within these virtual dance clubs. Um, 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 and I wanted to highlight a couple quotes that I found um, just you know, doing research in, in, some, in, in some publications. And the first one is from Jackie Rapkin. She's, she's at House of Yes in New York, who they have been running virtual dance parties um, throughout the last 14 months. And, and she says, you know, we knew our audience would be hungry to connect digitally and dance together in whatever way possible. Now people all over the world can tune in to our parties. And then the next quote is from Andra Sierra, 
who is the co-founder of Club Quarantine. And he says, it's really nice to be able to log in once a night and see all these amazing, beautiful queer people living their best lives. So really these quotes really speak to me to this, it's this idea of community and why there's a, there's a hunger to, to dance even virtually with folks and to really get that, that there's sort of a ritual in, in, in dance parties and connecting with people on the dance floor and in some way or another, people are hungry to recreate that virtually. And so uh, my, my idea or my definition of community is really, is really building off of uh, Melvin Weber's idea of community without propinquity. Um, and, and in 1963, he, he proposed the idea that advancements in communications technologies shifted the focus of place-based urban communities to other forms of connectivity, which led the urban realms to become manifestations of interest communities without distinct boundaries. So, you know, in, in cities, you're not just connected to your neighbors, you're also connected to people who have all these different interests from you across your, your city. Um, and so, um, and, but there's still direct relationships in, 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 in that context. Um, and Craig Calhoun in 1998 uh, sort of wanted to build on and, and respond to, to Melvin Weber in the sort of the age of the internet. And he really distinguished between interest versus categorical communities. And he claimed that the internet enables a proliferation of indirect relationships and argued that the internet fosters categorical communities where internet internauts connect with others with similar identities. So for example, being a social dancer or another um, similar identity might be, be queer or, you know, um, uh, so based on these very, very distinct categories and the important part here is indirect relationships. Um, and so from here, I kind of, uh, you know, surmise that Zoom native virtual dance clubs such as Club Quarantine can really be considered categorical communities. You're, you're indirectly in relationship with people who, who are coming to these virtual dance parties, um, but at the same time, and, and it's really based on identifying as a social dancer or maybe identifying as queer. Versus the place-based virtual dance communities have, which have a cross section of interest in categorical communities. So for example, with the, the uh, United We Stream, um, you know, run by the Berlin Trade Commission, uh, that's place-based in Berlin. And so you'll have interest communities there, but you might have folks logging in from anywhere in the world just because they're social dancers and wanna be part of, of, um, of that, uh, connecting with the community based on that categorical identity. And so finally, uh, the, la the last uh, sort of idea I'm grappling with is really this, the parallels between the, the urban and the internet, as in, and, and I posit that the urban and the internet are environments where subcultures can form communities and participate in the co-creation of both real and virtual spaces. Um, I'm really ba uh, basing this idea off of um, Har uh, David Harvey's uh, definition of the right to the city, which he defined as a right to change ourselves by changing the city. Of course, the right to the city was first defined by Lefebvre in, in 1996. Uh, and it was an, you know, the idea of being um, co-creating uh, uh, urban space, you know, devoid of commodification and capitalism. Um, in a paper that I published this past year, um, I, I really defined social dancing as a right to the city. I was looking at um, a movement in New York City in particular to um, protect social dancers from sexual harassment on, on, on the dance floors. And by doing so, you, you're creating a space where everyone can equally participate and change themselves while, while changing their city. And so from here, I'm, I want to think about how to define the right to the internet in a similar vein. And I'm putting out there that uh, the right to the internet is defined as a right to change ourselves by changing the internet. And it ent entails the ability to co-create virtual space detached from the effects of commodification and capitalism over social interaction and devoid of spatial inequalities. Um, some of my next steps moving forward, I'm, I'm running interviews with conver conversations with club, virtual club owners, performers and social dancers of in-person and virtual spaces. I'm also gonna be conducting a digital ethnography, um, looking at internet, internet dance communities, including their virtual parties and social media channels. Um, and I'm excited to be able to share some of my research on a website. Um, and my goal is really to start a conversation about how virtual nightlife might change the future of urban nightlife and what this means for cities more generally. Um, and that's all for today. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you, Rebecca. And thanks to everyone, all of the presenters. You had a great challenge to um, 
you know, condensed, amazing research, very thick description into 15 minutes. That's a massive challenge, and you all did quite well. And we have about 20 minutes, a little less, maybe time for q and A. I I want to point out that in the chat, uh, there are two very interesting links made, um, presented or, or, or um, deposited there by Emma and Avril. Um, related to the spaces, and please check those out. And while people are thinking for their, what they might ask, Manuela has a question, um, and I will read it out to you. Uh, this is to Rebecca, I imagine, since it was done right when that was going on. Yeah, thank you for this nice presentation. I have two questions. One, my impression, only as a distance observer and resident of Berlin, is that after the outbreak of the pandemic, there was also finally space to formulate the criticism of the previous party rush, the driving around the globe of DJs, tourists, the large sums of money spent and awarded, the uh, real estate, um, everything that concerns the scaling of local cultures, and so on. Is the digital space the parking zone to ramp this up again after the pandemic? So that's one question. Question two, who is using these clubs that have been moved into the private sphere? How are private spaces changing over this? How do people get around the pandemic rules? Have you researched this? So a lot there to think about. Great. Um, yes, thanks so much for these really interesting questions. So um, I, I would say, so this, the first, the question around the sort of this big rush and the sort of like, uh, the, it almost like the commodification of like uh, nightlife in the in pre-pandemic world of these like big, big name DJs and, you know, Berlin becoming this like true or like global hub where I'm, um, you know, tourists are com we're coming and um, I don't live in Berlin, but I spent some time there and I know from locals that there's some frustration with just the, the, the overwhelming amounts of tourists in, in these spaces. And I, I think that there's, there's been a reckoning around who, uh, for who do these um, cultural spaces belong to. Um, but I think this idea of reckoning during the pandemic is always a, is an interesting question because I think people are sharing all these ideas about how they want the world to look like after the pandemic but we'll only know how that really plays out once we're all back in, in person. So I think that's something that we can only sort of surmise what, what might go on. Um, and, and I hope that kind of uh, answers your question. And then in, in the question around um, these digital spaces, um, I think what's beautiful about them is their global, the global reach. I mean, the fact that someone can tune into a party that's run by United We Stream in Berlin, you know, sitting in, in you know, New York or wherever, um, I think that's 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 kind of a beautiful thing to be able to connect with other people who are social dancers around the world at any time, and and so um, I think that's an interesting thing. And I'm not sure what you mean the parking zone, um, but I, I hope this this kind of, this answers your question. Um, and then in terms of the questions about these clubs moving into private sphere, so I don't know I don't know that much about what's going on in Berlin, although I've been reading quite a bit of articles that there are illegal parties that have been going on ongoing throughout the pandemic. Uh, mostly outside of the city of Berlin. So when moving out to Brandenburg and other places where you really have to go into the more regional areas. Um, and um, so th these are happening and, and there's danger in them. Like one of the articles I was reading was saying that they're, you know, they were at a, at a um, old warehouse space had no running water. So if there's an emergency, how, you know, just the, just these like small things that you have to consider, but people are so hungry to go out dancing. Um, it, where I live in New York City, there's just tons and tons of underground parties that have been ongoing throughout the, the pandemic, people, you know, and the way party goers describe it, the social dancers describe it, that they, they think about social dancing as a ritual. It's almost like a religious experience and um, they, they feel a need to be it, together with other people in person. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. I, I hope that that's, that answers your question, Manuela. Thank you. Ben, did you have something to say directly to this? Yeah, uh, yeah, just on this, I thought, um... I thought that was interesting. I thought um, Rebecca's comments about the internet and the city are quite 
evocative and provocative. And I'm wondering, like, when all of these spaces are hosted hosted on something like Zoom, how how much room is there to experiment within that space? It's so controlled. So, um, you know, if you think about the history of those spaces being coming up in uh, cracks in the urban fabric, where there's been practical ways of experimenting with new technologies in spaces that are not necessarily in high residential, high density residential areas or whatever. How, how I'm just wondering if you know of any examples where people are actually technically innovating within Zoom or is that an impossibility? And I think for me talking to Ducky, that was something that they're interested in. And also I wonder if there are more local online clubs because I think Ducky was surprised that they, they thought they were going global, but actually they ended up with quite a lot of their own punters. And that's because they're going through their own network. So the, the, the dynamic between the local and global is kind of interesting to think about here, I think, um, yeah. Uh, sure. So on the question of the local party, so you know, most of my research focuses on, on venues in New York City and those venues, for example, House of Yes, which is one of the quotes that I, I highlighted in my presentation. And then also nowadays, the, they've had some global interaction, but it's been primarily local and, and it's sort of a, so it really um, fits the more interest communities um, and place-based, um, but so on the question of yes, yeah, so of course Zoom is a is a profit seeking, you know, profit making company. So it's not fully devoid of sort of capitalism. But but I think what's interesting is that you know anyone you know you, you can have a it, it's a low cost to to, to a low cost um, option in terms of uh, owning an account and having people join your party as opposed to owning an actual venue in a, in a city where, where rents are really expensive. I have heard of um, you know. Um, uh, I, there, there has been some rumbling in New York City to create platforms that are uh, created by artists for artists or created by venues for venues, where it would be um, open sourced and similar to the functionings of Zoom, but not owned by Zoom or, or you know, any of the sort of bigger tech companies. So it's happening. Um, I think the, the, the question is, you know, finding the right people to do it and some startup capital to make it happen. Um, but the idea would be to make these platforms free and available to, to artists um, all over the world. So I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with people once I hear more about it. Right, thanks. There, there is a question from Sada, but um, it's also to Rebecca and I, maybe I'll come back to that. I wanna make sure that there's some questions to our other presenters. And um, I have one while people are thinking about it. Uh, I was struck by both um, Ava, Katie's presentation and Ben, that is the affordances of darkness. So for Ava and Katie, I, I mean, I wanted to ask you, do you think that it seems that you suggest that the night has some particular quality that engenders memory. So I wanted to ask if, if that's a fair statement, how would, might you respond? And then for Ben, I was very interested in knowing more about how you relate uh, queer infrastructures with this protective darkness that I think is from Munoz. Um, that seems fascinating to me as well. Throwing it out there for you guys. Okay, <laughs> that's nobody. Nobody else is biting. I'm, go I'm going to start, but um, please, Katie, jump in at any point. Um, well, just to say, I suppose Derek, it links. Uh, you're saying what's what's particular about the night and memory, and I suppose uh, first of all, you have to, to to scrape that back a level and say, well, what's more particular about the night, even before we get into memory, because yeah. um, the night itself, we have found in, in other research, also not, not necessarily to deal with this web project, but in looking at night spaces in Galway and Cork, that there is this um, liberating aspect of darkness and the night um, for these uh, Black Irish, Afro-Irish communities, this kind of loosening of the rules um, that that happens um, as soon as it becomes night, how, whenever that becomes, I know is debatable. But um, so already the night has has um, this kind of, as I say, liberating effect in in how people engage with each other. 
um, as a Galwegian community or Corcoran, you know, community. But then, of course, in the memory, that's another layer, isn't it? So um, there is something. I mean, what I would say is this. I'm glad you brought it up, Derek, because I haven't thought about it that much yet, <laughs> which is there's there's also this kind of dreamlike idea, I think, that, that comes with the memories that, and you know, Katie and I are still analysing the transcripts, by the way. Um, there's a certain dreamlike quality to the memories. And I don't think you can really separate that from the notion of night. And if I'm thinking of the presentations yesterday and that idea of dreaming and lucid dreaming, etc., I think there's definitely something to be thought about there in more depth. Um, there's definitely something to that. Katie, I don't know if you have any opinions on that or if you think I've gone off on a, a weird side road. <laughs> um, uh, well, something else that's come to mind as well, um, not necessarily linked to these specific memories, but in general in interviews, there's been, um, whenever I ask, um, like, what do you find is particular about the night? And there's um, a lot of discussion of movement, like in the daytime, I'm sitting down in my room or I look at my window and nothing's there. And at night, there's there's so much movement and I think coming back to the memories from uh, from the project there really was so much um kind of focus and detail on mobility and movement between spaces um between people and I think uh I guess that might be a unique aspect at least um in our research of the night was was more movement more interaction with space and people yeah good I mean I was thinking of uh Rob Shaw's talk, as well as Sara, that brought this notion that in darkness, there's an intimacy. People, I think Rob said something about being more aware of the environment, taking more broadly this sort of intimacy. So the, that such a powerful story in your presentation of the woman talking about waffles, you know, the sensorial thing that like got her thinking and creating you know, and that was something particular to, of course, you could have waffles any time of the day, but it, but she wouldn't remember it that way, perhaps. Um, so the sensorial, the environmental, I think there's something there to be developed. I, I really, I was struck by that. Yeah, and just, uh, and, and I won't dwell please. on it too much, Derek, but just to, to link back in, this very much links with what you're talking about, that kind of heightened awareness or, or, or something very specific or different links with that, um, Lefebvre's concept of the moment, you know, which is what we're trying to to use as an analytical tool in thinking about this, that that idea of moment offers you another lens uh, to think about the, the, those, those particular qualities. Excellent. Um, ben? Uh... Yeah, that's a really uh, interesting question and conversation. And I was also struck by the comfort of dimness in, uh, that you referred to in your work. Um, I think for me, the, the question of darkness, yeah, I think it's, it's, it varies according to uh, different communities within LGBT communities. It varies according to generations um, um, and places in terms of uh, how we might think about that. But certainly there's, there's an idea of, yeah, the, the darkness in nightclubs as being dematerializing and therefore liberating from certain kinds of disciplinary or scopic regimes. Um, there's also, um, uh, I mean, the, it also makes me think about sort of epistemological lightness or darkness. And I think the current moment of drawing, illuminating night scenes in particular way in order to um, campaign for the value of these spaces is interesting because it means that we're exposing certain things that might normally be under cover of darkness in certain contexts. And so what level of scrutiny do you want I mean, at the moment with the pandemic as well, with these businesses having to register their patrons and so on, and there's, there's a kind of governmental um, uh, illumination that might not be very welcome, actually. Um, and then I think also it's interesting to think about um, the different qualities of darkness in relation to queer populations in different parts of the world when you look at something like what Ducky are doing and how they're connecting artists between Brazil and South Africa and the UK and wherever, you know, there's, these are not all in the same place in terms of the rights or otherwise of these groups, and they're not even in the same time zone. So, yeah, I think your, your questions, um, for me, it's opened up lots of um, things that I need to think about more. Thank you. 
Yeah, def- um, what someone is saying, just Avril said something about surveillance and surveilling, Ben? Definitely, yes. Yeah, that's, um, I think that that's really key. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, so there's a materiality, there's an, uh, there is a desire to express materiality, but at the same time, there's a, there's also a desire to use darkness as a protection, um, right? Uh, so um, I feel that. I felt this real force of contradiction um, in your talk that, as again, to repeat, I felt like throughout the whole conference, um, to augment the city at night is both liberating and really scary. Uh, it's threatening, but also invigorating. Um, so I really appreciate all the different expressions around that more macro level uh, condition that we're dealing with. Maybe I can go back to Sada's um, question that's to Rebecca, and we, cause we still have a few minutes uh, where she asks, following on Manuela's question, have you, do you have info on people using these online dances who didn't party before? Uh, I, that is like online is liberating different age groups, for example, I guess I'm imagining, yeah, like the social science teacher and like boomers on there, like totally. Yeah. Like so this actually, is their moment. Yeah. Go yeah ahead, there, are, there are a number of people who, um, who've penned essays saying, you know, that they, they stopped going to dance clubs maybe in their early 20s, that being around a lot of people or whatever, or just the, how demanding their jobs were, they, they couldn't you know, give up that, their nights on weekends, that this has been a, a resurgence for them of like being able to enjoy social dancing with others from the comfort of their homes or people who are parents who can't find a, a babysitter to watch their kids while they go out at night. This has been a blessing for them to be able to connect with others. So, um, and then others who never were club club goers who have found this, you know, kind of it piqued their curiosity to to check in here once, and they've completely um, latched onto it. So, uh, certainly, this has been an opportunity. Uh, an op- there, there are folks who would pr- who prefer the virtual dance spaces to the in person dance spaces, um, which I think is fascinating. Great. Um... Wonderful. We have still a minute, but if not, that's great too, because we're like, we have like only a short little break before panel five uh, on platform labor. I think I'm looking still in the chat. I, again, I want to say thank you to all the presenters because they're beautiful, very thoughtful presentations, given the time constraints. And when I was listening to some of them i kept thinking about i'm going to give a um i'm going to give a plug for <laughs> an album that i you know i have no like personal connection to other than i think it's awesome which is a group called blood orange and their 2019 album negro swan has an ongoing dialogue on going commentary by someone who keeps saying you know they always say to us that we're doing too much And in this year, that is my pledge. I want to do too much. And I think so many people are doing so much during these trying times, working with the contradictions that we've been discussing, that it makes me feel a little bit better as I move on and I look out the window and the sun is shining. So uh, we have, I think, comments. Do we have any questions? Yeah, um, Alva chiming in here with some, some comments, some thanks. Great. Wonderful. Um, If there's no other questions, uh, let's take a break, get some coffee, and see you in panel five. Yes? Thank you, Derek. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Yes, thank you. Thank you, the panelists. See you, too. Ciao.